So I'm going to go ahead on and read the text, y'all, and we're going to get into it. We've been just going deep into this series, man, just, just going deep into this, this, this book of Joel, y'all, this chapter and chapter two, man, just, just taking our time, y'all, and, and we done covered some ground, man. I was looking back, I'm like, bro, I can't do no recap all the way to the beginning, Mr. Franklin. <laughs> I'm like, man, we done covered some ground, y'all, and um, we're going to be getting the messages out, man. We was able to get one out, you know what I'm saying, and, um, you know, we're going to continue, man, you know what I'm saying, doing the work of the Lord, but um, I'm going to go ahead on and read the text, and I'm going to give a real brief a brief um recap, y'all. And we're gonna go in. I probably recap just what we talked about um last week, y'all, for the sake of time. But I'm gonna read the text. The Bible say in Joel chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. Joel chapter 2, verse 17 through 18. The Bible say, Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your inheritance to reproach, that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. Lord, we thank you for your word, your gracious word, God. We ask that you feed us tonight, God. I ask that I decrease and you increase, God, that you take 100% control of me, God. We come against every unclean spirit, God, everything that would try to hinder your word from going forth. We bind it in the name of Jesus, God. We ask that your presence, God, be ushered in, O King, and finish, God, throughout this whole service, God. We thank you, Father Lord, for your presence even now, God. So have your way, Master. In Jesus' mighty name, amen, amen, and amen. Well, the title of this message, y'all, we, we, we gave it to you. The title is Israel, forsake not the ministry of being priests. Forsake not the ministry of being priests, y'all. And, man, we had a lentil of um, points, y'all, and we just taking our time just going through this series, and it's going to bring us to this, this, this place of prayer where we want to be, y'all, for God to move just like he moved for Jabez, just like he moved within this text for Joel and for the people of God in these New Testament times, this far future prophecy, y'all, that Joel prophesied about. And we went in, we talked about our first point, y'all, and we got an understanding of the day of the Lord. Because I told you, and we've seen it throughout the scriptures, that Joel, the whole chapters, every single chapter, chapter one, he quoted this phrase, the day of the Lord. Chapter two, the day of the Lord. Chapter three, the day of the Lord. And we went in and we learned about the day of the Lord, what the day of the Lord is. And that's what our point was, an uh, understanding of the day of the Lord. If you remember, and then our second point was let the priest, y'all. Let the priest. And we just went in talking about let the priest. And man, we, we went in just, just talking about how Joel prophesied let the priest. And we told you that it wasn't really Joel because we know how the prophet operate. We know the gift of prophecy that is God that speaks through the prophet. Matthew is God that speaks through the prophet and, 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 and the prophet speaks for the word of God. Who in a true prophet, he speaks only, we said, was thus said the Lord. He don't speak his own words. And that's what the scripture said in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, when they was going ham, going whack, you know what I'm saying? Going a whole different direction than God would have them. God said, man, I'm going to deal with the shepherds. And then he said, I'm going to raise up shepherds after my own heart. And he told them, he said, if the prophets would have seek my face and get a word from me, who, not their own word, but a word from me, he said, then the people would have heard and their hearts would have turned. So that's the job of the prophet. And Joel is a real prophet, we said, y'all. 
And we told you we went through the, the context of this scripture, how the theologians and all of them, they, they all come together and understand that Joel is prophesying about a future day, about a, a day in, the, in these New Testament times that never took place yet, y'all. And we just talked about that, how God would call for the priest, who call for the priest in these New Testament days. You know what I'm saying? And we begged that. We, it, it was a question, where are the priests of God? Where are the priests of God? And we said, talked about, is no Levitical priesthood no more. But we still said, where are the priests of God? We talked about that there's no Old Testament priesthood no more. It's no temple no more. Uh, Matthew, if you remember, we talked about that. And then we told you, nah, not under the Levitical priesthood. <laughs> Not under the Old Testament priesthood after the order of Aaron, but after the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. Ooh, ooh. After the priesthood of Christ, y'all, who sits as our high priest. As our high priest, and we just went in about that, talking about that, giving you scripture, just going deep on how Christ, even he was the high priest, y'all. But even deeper than that, we said he was the incarnated Christ that came ooh, before the Old Testament. In the, new, in, the, in, in, in the beginning, during the days of Abraham, he showed up in the form of the king of Salem. He showed up in the form of Melchizedek himself. With no beginning, no end, no earthly father, y'all. A priest forever. And that's the priesthood we talking about. Not in the Old Testament days, but in these New Testament times, God is calling for the priests. And we just went in talking about how this message came about, about me weeping one Sunday morning, y'all. And God showing me, begging me, I got up crying, showing me this stench that was placed upon the priest. Placed upon this office of the priest, y'all. And that's why it was never picked up. That's why it was never really talked about and made known. But it's a whole prophecy about the priest. Not in the Old Testament time, but in the New Testament time. You know what I'm saying? But we went in and we talked about how the Catholic Church put a, put a stigma upon this office of the priest, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And we just went in about that, man. And I ain't got time to go deep into it, but... For, for, for time's sake, man, we started off last time, y'all. We started off last time finishing off this, this let the priest, y'all. This let the priest. And it was a message that was, that was all about, ooh, let me find it, y'all. <laughs> In Jesus' name. There you go, there you go. Yeah, we went into this message, man, and it was all about, y'all, us going deep into this prophetic call. You know what I'm saying? And we talked about how it was important, y'all. I was important, this prophetic call. And we said that it was important, y'all, because it was a, a New Testament time, you know what I'm saying, prophetic call primarily to the priests of Israel, primarily to the priests of the church of the true and living God, y'all, in our New Testament days, in these New Testament times. You know what I'm saying? And we said that it was very important. The first reason it was important, y'all, it because Joel called unto the priest in these last days, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And, and we said that, that, that it was not too long afterwards God would bring forth revival. He would pour out his spirit upon all flesh, y'all. In chapter 2, verse 7, and we gave you the context and went through, man, looking at John MacArthur and everybody. And then we got to this second reason, and that's where I want to be, y'all. We got to this second reason 
You know what I'm saying? Of why it's was very, very important, this call that God makes, y'all, himself unto the office of the priest in these last days. And we went in. This is, this is, this is what it is, y'all. God called unto the office of the priest, we say. You know what I'm saying? And as God was calling unto this office of the priest, y'all, he specifically was targeting. He was calling the man of God, the man of God. And that's what the message was all about. We told you it was kind of like a late Father's Day message. You know what I'm saying? Because this priest, this office of the priest is an is a office that's masculine. It's an office that's tailor-made for the man of God, Shane. And remember, we talked about that, man, just going deep into what this priest is. We gave you the definition, you know what I'm saying? The Hebrew word for this priest was kohan, y'all, K-O-H-E-N, kohan. And it, and it, and it meant, y'all, you know what I'm saying, specifically talk, targeting, you know what I'm saying, in Genesis chapter 18, verse 18, Melchizedek. He was a priest of the Most High God, y'all. But it was also a verb meaning to serve as priests, to do priestly things, y'all. It also means a chief ruler, a owner, a priest, prince, principal officer. And then we got into it as a Hebrew noun that means masculine, y'all. And we just went in, man. We even went into talking about the ecclesia, um, ecclesia the, um, the clergy, y'all. The ecclesiastical positions of the church, man. Just talking about how God had set an order, y'all, according to Paul the Apostle. And I just gave you the scriptures this time. I, I brought the scriptures, man, in uh, 1 Corinthians. Sound boot, I don't know if I gave it to you, but it's 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33 through 38, y'all. You know what I'm saying? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 through 15, and I'm going to kind of just summarize it, but it's talking about Paul in, in Corinthians is laying down the order of the church. He's laying down the order of the church, y'all, and he breaks this thing down on, on, on how God had set an order. Because we talked about that, 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 uh, that this office was mainly talking about the men, y'all. It was targeting the men of God. You know what I'm saying? And, and we told you that in certain positions, certain positions that, that God had set only for the man of God to operate in. You know what I'm saying? We told you that, 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 that both are created equal in creation, y'all. But they are different when it comes to certain positions according to the ability that God made them. You know what I'm saying? And man, I'm going to just read it. We talked about that Paul, that, that, that even though church, church has tradition, just like, like the, the secular have con, um, tradition, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes church tradition don't follow truth. It don't follow truth, y'all. It don't line up with truth. So we went deep just talking about how God had set an order. You know what I'm saying? Concerning the ecclesiastical positions in the church, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And um, I'm going to just go ahead on and read it since we're here. For God, Paul said, God is not an author of confusion, but of peace, as in the churches of the saints. As in all the churches of the saints. Verse 33, let the woman keep silent in the church. For they are not permitted to speak. And all he's saying, let the women be quiet. They're not permitted to teach over a congregation. You know what I'm saying? And that's all Paul is saying. Because the woman of God is able to teach. You know what I'm saying? But just not over authority, over a man. And Paul makes that clear. Even in 1 Timothy, Paul talks about, he said, permit a woman to teach or to have, permit not a woman to teach or to have authority over the man, but to be silent. For Adam was found first by God from, from the earth and Eve. Talking about Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, y'all. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman who was led astray and fell to, into sin. And all that scripture is saying is that the man, y'all, he wouldn't deceive. 
he willfully sinned. Ooh, you see, that's why Satan never came to the man in the first place. The man never was, he never was beguiled. He never was deceived. He willfully sinned. But the woman was tricked. The woman was deceived, y'all. And that's what God is saying. And God broke this thing down, you know what I'm saying? And I gave you an example through Deborah and Barak in the book of Judges. And Deborah, y'all, was a, she was a, she was a judge over all of Israel at that time. But even in her position of being a judge, you know what I'm saying, she understood the positions that God set. You know what I'm saying? So she called out to Barak to lead them out in war, yo. To lead them out in war. You know what I'm saying? And that was brilliant of Deborah to understand that even though she was a position higher, she understood that it was certain positions that she couldn't operate in, that was delegated and shaped for the man, yo. And she understood that. We even gave you a quote from pastor, man, just going deep into the ecclesiastical um, positions of the church, man. You know what I'm saying? A quote that blessed my life, I told you, man. You know what I'm saying? And I'm trying my best not to go so deep into it, y'all. But y'all haven't been wanting to preach it again, man. So that's why I'm kind of like, you know. But um, he gave a quote, man, and it blessed my life, y'all. He said, God is concerned with getting us to the end goal was doing the things that we supposed to do, Nick. You know what I'm saying? Whether the woman or the man, you know what I'm saying? Because there's certain positions and things that men not supposed to operate in according to the scriptures. And he said, he said, God is concerned with us getting to the goal, y'all, but he's also concerned with the way in which we get there. And that thing blessed my life, man. Because I was all about getting the job done. I was all about getting the end result, y'all, no matter the cost, no matter how it's done. But after I understood that and he broke that down, it showed me how to lead my family. It showed me, and that's what we're going to get into, it showed me how to lead my family, y'all, according to the ways of God and not according to my own ways. It blessed me, Mr. Franklin, you know what I'm saying? Because God is concerned on how we do what we do. He is concerned about it, y'all. You know what I'm saying? He is concerned about it. And we talked about that this was a call of the priest, y'all, unto the man of God, unto the men specifically. And we gave you scriptures, man, on how God, y'all, through Paul in these New Testament times, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8, Paul begins to call unto the men. He said, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and without doubting. Without wrath and without doubting, y'all. He began to call unto the men of God. And we went in about it just letting you know and showing you that, that, that some things don't move until the men of God pray. You know what I'm saying? Because we pack the house, the women pack the house when it's prayer time. But most of the time, the men are nowhere to be found. And that's what Paul was saying. Men ought to pray everywhere. And we gave you the scripture in Luke 18, 1, y'all. Even Jesus talked about it. You know what I'm saying? Then he spoke, Jesus said, the Bible said, then he spoke to them that the men always ought to to pray and not lose heart, y'all. He spoke a parable to them that the men should always pray and not lose heart. This is Jesus talking, y'all. This is Jesus talking. And then he continued, man, and, and, and just went through all kind of scriptures, just bringing you to that place where we're trying to go, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Scriptures, not only uh, for our individual prayer, but we talked about Elijah, y'all. Being a man, y'all, with a nature like ours, but yet prayed earnestly in James 5, 17, that it would not rain, and it did not rain in, on the land for three years and six months, y'all. We talked about Isaac, how Isaac pleaded for his wife, y'all, because Rebecca wanted a child she was barren. 
And she prayed to God. She cried out to God. But the Bible said now Isaac in um, Genesis 25, 21, Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived, y'all. And then we talked about corporate prayer, going into Acts chapter 1, verse 13, 13 through 14, y'all. How the, how the men of God, they, they got together in the upper room, y'all. This was the first time that the Holy Spirit fell. You know what I'm saying? When they had entered, the Bible said, y'all, and they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, uh, Tholomew, uh, Matthew, James, y'all. You know what I'm saying? All the men of God, y'all. They was up in that upper room playing, praying, making supplication with the women, y'all. But it was mainly the men. The Bible named the men first. And that's when we see the Holy Spirit come down in a way that never had happened before, y'all. Never had happened before. It came down with cloven fire of tongues, y'all, that set upon their head, y'all. You know what I'm saying? It was the first entrance of the Holy Spirit. And it happened when men got together and prayed, y'all. That's when it happened. We told, showed it to you in Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4 as well, y'all. And now we just want to continue, y'all. We want to continue to this third point. This third point, weep between the porch and the altar. Weep between the porch and the altar. And that's where we want to be, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Our third point, weep between the porch and the altar. And sound boot, I don't know if I, I sent you that picture. I sent you a picture of um, the porch and the altar before we get into it. And it talks about it in 1 Kings chapter 6, y'all. Sound boot, I don't know if I gave it to you. I sent you a picture of it, y'all. But if you don't have it, y'all, it's okay. Um, the, that's it right there. Ooh, that's it right there. Thank you, sound boot. I, I was looking for it right there. That's it right there. And what I wanted y'all to see, y'all, it says, weep between the porch and the altar. Right between the pulses, the brown pulses, Porch, um, pulses is the porch, y'all. And then you got the blazing altar right here where they would make the sacrifices. And that's going to be good for you to understand because we about to get into that, y'all. It's the brazen altar where they would sacrifice the lamb or the oxen, y'all. You know what I'm saying? To make atonement for the sins of the people of God. And the priest had to atone for himself first, y'all. And that's the, the bla bla brazen altar, but, but the porch is right between and, 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 and um, the altar, the incense altar is right before the, the, um, the veil, y'all. It's um, number four, y'all. <laughs> it's small, but it's right before the veil. And that's the pathway that the priest would take. That's the path where they would take, sprinkle in the blood, y'all. They would walk between the porch and the altar, y'all. And that's what the scripture is saying. It's telling them to weep between the porch and the altar. And that's how it was done in these Old Testament times, y'all. They would weep between the porch and the altar. And we about to get into it. I just wanted to show you a picture of that. You know what I'm saying? And we get this straight from our scripture in Joel chapter 2, verse 17. The Bible said, let the priest who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. So we see, y'all, that Joel tells the priest to weep between the porch and the altar. He tells him to weep between the porch and the altar, y'all. Now, as we study and we look at this weeping between the porch and the altar, y'all, of the priests in these Old Testament times. Also, everything that the priests did within ministering to the Lord, y'all, in these Old Testament times. I have in my notes, as we correlated to these New Testament times, as we correlated to these New Testament times, it all correlates and symbolizes as an act of prayer, y'all. 
it all correlates and symbolizes as an act of prayer, y'all. This, this, this weeping between the porch of the altar. This weeping between the porch of the altar of the Levitical priesthood in these Old Testament times. In every single thing that they did in order to have service within the temple, yo. You know what I'm saying? Every single thing that they did, you know what I'm saying? Including the sacrifice offering. Including the offerings of incense, yo. Everything that they did, yo. You know what I'm saying? I have in my notes, y'all, at the root of it, at the root of it, it was all about prayer. It was all about trying to communicate with God. It was all about trying to pull on the heart of God, y'all. It was all about getting in position, y'all, getting in right relationship with God. It was all about getting in the right posture before God, y'all. And it symbolizes prayer. It symbolized prayer, y'all. This weeping between the porch and the altar. And I have in my notes King David, y'all. The man after God on heart, y'all. The one who understood the heart of God, Shane. You see, David was on another level, man. David not only knew the law, but he knew the intent of the law. He knew the heart behind the law. You know what I'm saying? He knew the intent of it. It's just like us knowing the law that we don't go on raid or knowing the law of abiding by the speed limit, y'all. But the heart of the matter, the intent of this law is what? Is not to get in a crash. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes you might have to slow down, Matthew, to abide the principle of the law. Even though you're going below the speed limit, you slowing down not to get in a crash. <laughs> And the principle of the law is greater than the law itself, y'all. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. They don't understand the intent of the law. They don't understand the heart of God. And that's why David was so much on another level in these Old Testament times. He understood God better than some of the priests. He understood God better than a lot of the prophets in those days, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And here we're going to see in Psalms, Psalms chapter 141, verse 2, y'all. I have in my notes, David, he makes this correlation, y'all, in the liking of his prayer as a symbol of an incense offering. As a symbol, y'all, of an offering of a sacrifice that the priest has made in the temple. And as I'm studying this and I'm looking at this, I'm like, man, David liking his prayer unto the sacrifices of the priests, y'all. Unto the offering of the incense and all that they do to have service within the temple, y'all. He liking it to it. And we read it. Look what, look, look what David said, y'all, in his psalm. He said, may my prayer be set before you like an incense. And he's talking about the offering of the incense, y'all, that the priest would make. The priest would go day and night, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And we're going to get into it. We're going to look at commentary because service, it went from day unto day, y'all. Even evening service. You know what I'm saying? And it was all about appeasing God, all about trying to communicate with God, trying to call unto God, y'all. And David makes this, this correlation. He makes this symbol of his prayer. You know what I'm saying? He pictured it as a symbol of an incense offering, y'all. But also he say, my, my, my uplifted hands like the evening offering. Who talking about sacrificing a lamb, y'all? You know what I'm saying? When you go back and study that. And I'm reading this and I'm like, man, David symbolizes his prayer, yo, as the Old Testament offering of a sacrifice of a lamb, of an incense offering, yo. David symbolizes his prayer in that fashion. That's how important prayer is, yo. And not only that, we see Jesus, yo, I have in my notes, who had all knowledge, yo, 
of every single act of service that took place within the temple in these Old Testament times. You know what I'm saying? Jesus, y'all having all knowledge in Matthew 21, 13. And it's going to be more of a, of a, of a, of a scriptural basis message, y'all, because we want to understand this before we get into this prayer, y'all. Into this prayer that we're going to get into. You need to understand how deep is prayer. This thing is fashion. This thing symbolizes all that the priests did in the Old Testament times. In the Levitical priesthood. You know what I'm saying? And as I'm studying this, I'm looking at this. And it, and it, and it brought me to the scripture of Jesus in Matthew 21 and 13, yo. Jesus having all knowledge of everything that took place within the temple. Look what Jesus said, the Bible said, and he said to them, it is written. And talking about it was written in, um, in Isaiah was the scripture quoted in um, Isaiah 56, verse 6, I think, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But to keep going, Jesus, you know the scripture. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. He said, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And Jesus understanding all that took place. Jesus coming to fulfill the law. He understood all the offerings that the priest did. He understood, y'all, all the incense offerings. He understood every single act of service that took place within the temple, y'all. And Jesus correlated he brought it all down to his house being called a house of prayer a house of prayer you know what i'm saying and it's important y'all it's important for the man of god it's important y'all for the father it's important for the priest of his own house how much more the priest of the house of god who ministers to the lord who take care of everything in the house of god Yo, that's how important prayer is. And in these days, most churches, they don't let prayer go, yo. So that's why we bringing this to you. We bringing this to you because this is God making us bring this to you. Because the devil don't like prayer, yo. It's one of the most things he fight in the church. You could get a bunch of people together for this and for that in the church. But when it's time to come together for prayer, yo. Who the devil fight us the hardest, man? You know what I'm saying? Because it's a spiritual weapon, and we're going to get into it next time, y'all, when we come back from our little, our little say lie like Paul is said. You know what I'm saying? So I ain't come with too much today, you know what I'm saying? But I just wanted to show you this and bring this to you to understand how important this prayer is that we about to go into. Jesus called it a house of prayer. You know what I'm saying? A house of prayer with all the offerings, with all the sacrifices. He called it a house of prayer, y'all. And not only that, Psalm, Psalms, um, verse 134, verse 2, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And this, um, John MacArthur say, it's all about the service of God. It's all about the worship of God that took place in the Old Testament, y'all. And they said, look what it said. It said, lift up your hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. They was worshiping the Most High. In the Old Testament time, as the priest weep between the porch, as he do his service between the porch and the altar, y'all, they would lift hands, they would praise the Most High, having service both day and night. <laughs> and I'm reading that and I'm like, man, come on, man. The priests never sleep, y'all. It was a ship. That's why they had so many of them. And I didn't understood that until I studied this, that they was having service. And I understood that the, that the, ooh, that the, that the menorah, it had to be lit both day and night. It couldn't die out. It could, the fire couldn't go out. So the priest had to always be in service, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And that's important, man. He said, lift up hands to the sanctuary and bless the Lord. 
You know what I'm saying? And it all correlates to this symbol of prayer, y'all. Even worship, man. Even worship at its root, B, is all about prayer. And we don't understand that. It's all about prayer. That's why I brought that song to you last time from Brian Trado. Tell me when the last time you really hit your knees and started to intercede for everything your family needs. How much more in the church, man? How much more in the church when you understand how deep prayer is? Because Jesus could have, he could have, he could have said anything about the house of God. He could have called it anything, but he called it a house of prayer. With all that was going on in it, y'all. And I got some commentary for you. Benson commentary talks about the same thing, y'all. Benson commentary, look what he says. You know what I'm saying? And it's, and, and, and it's going to bring us into the place where we want to be. Matter of fact, I'm going to read Bourne's commentary first, y'all. Bourne's commentary, you know what I'm saying? It says, let the priest minister to the Lord, weeping between the porch and the altar. He said a porch in this Solomon temple was in fact a tower, y'all, in front of the holies of holies, the same breadth with the temple, namely 20 cubits. And he go into all the dynamics of building the temple, y'all. And it talks about it in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 3. It talks about how Solomon built the temple and went into all the dynamics of it, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And the altar was brass, he said. You know what I'm saying? Going deep into it. But where we want to be, he said, the space between the porch and the altar was enclosed on those two sides. It was enclosed on both sides, y'all. It became the inner part of the court of the priest. Through it, the priests or the high priests passed whenever they went to sprinkle the blood, ty to, um, typifying the atonement before the veil of the tabernacle or of any office of the tabernacle. It seems to have been a place for the, for it, it seemed to have been a place of prayer for the priest, y'all. It seemed to have been a place of prayer for the priest. You know what I'm saying? And I'm just bringing this to you. And um, it talks about it. Benson talks about it. He, um, he says the priest being a peculiar sense to the Lord's servants, y'all. Being a servant of the Lord, a peculiar sense. Or here acquired to take the lead in this sacred work of penance. And that's what verse 12 is all about. And we're going to get in touch. You know what I'm saying? Verse 12, chapter, um, I got in my notes, Joel chapter 2, verse 12 to verse 17 is all about what's called penance, y'all. You know what I'm saying? The caption of it is a call to repentance. A call to repentance. And that's what we're going to see that it's all about. It's all about repentance, y'all. You know what I'm saying? And we repent through prayer. We call upon the Lord through prayer. But that's what it's all about. But I love how he says, you know what I'm saying, that, that here acquired to take the lead of this sacred work of penance, to stand weeping and praying before the porch and the altar, y'all. Benson said that the priest must take the lead in this work. He must take the lead in this work of repentance, y'all. This work of prayer, this work of weeping between the porch and the altar. Ooh, now we're going to talk to us. He said the priest must take the, the lead in this thing. It must take the lead. He must go first, y'all. And we, we liken this to the man of God. We liken this to the man of the house of God, who is the head of the church under Christ, y'all. You know what I'm saying? But also the man of God who is the head of the woman. For Christ is the head of the man. We liken this. He said that, that the priest got to go first in this act. Got to go first in this penance, y'all. You know what I'm saying? 
And in Joel, I have in my note, Joel chapter 2, verse 12 through 16, I'm going to read it and we're going to get into this. You know what I'm saying? Because this call of repentance, it starts, y'all, in chapter 12. It starts in chapter 12. And it starts with the people of God. <laughs> it starts with the people of God. It starts with the congregation, y'all. You know what I'm saying? He mentioned it first unto the people. You know what I'm saying? But it really starts, and it really got to be led by the priest. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It only, it only starts with a mention unto the people. You know what I'm saying? And I love this when you study it, how God, he, 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 it's like he, he spoke it up to a, 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 ooh, up to a climax. He spoke it up to a level until it got to the priest. And then he said, ooh, weep between the porch and the altar. It's like he mentioned it to the children, but he didn't get, he didn't, he didn't want it to start until after he talked to the father. Ooh, God in the name of Jesus. Because a lot of times, y'all, you know what I'm saying? The priests, ooh, especially in the days of Jesus. Jesus called them what? He called them blind guides, man. He said, how can the blind lead the blind? Both going to end up in a ditch, y'all. Because these priests, Jesus went off, he called them a root of vipers. He said, how can you make it into the kingdom of heaven? And what these priests would do, y'all, they would point out everything for the people to do that they wouldn't do themselves. <laughs> and Jesus warned his disciples, he said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, of the priests, man. Of them in the courts, Mr. Franklin, he said, beware of their leaven. He said, don't you, don't you, don't you respect their position of authority, don't do what they do. He's saying, don't do what they say. You know what I'm saying? And a lot of times, God brought this to me. That's how men operate in their household. They want to lead like the Gentiles. They want to lead Larkin. They want to tell the woman to do this and tell them to do that, but they don't want to lead first. <laughs> they don't want to go before. He said, the priestess. Is the leading in this operation. He said, let the priest, the priest go before, y'all. They don't want to lead before. And not just in the things that we should do, but also in repentance. When we fall short. You see, repentance means to turn. It means to turn from wrong and turn back to God. It's a 180 pivot, yo. You know what I'm saying? And, and sometimes the priests, you know what I'm saying? Not sometimes, ooh, but all the time. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because you got to understand, you know what I'm saying? That we none perfect. And David said it like this in the Old Testament. You got to catch these gems. David said it like this. He said, Lord, let me quickly repent. Mm. He said, let me quickly repent with the smallest of sin. He said, let me quickly repent. And that's one of the prayers I always pray. Let me quickly repent, man. And me lead my family, y'all. I not only lead my family in the things of God and doing right, but I lead my family also when it's time to repent. Also, when I fall short, also in areas that we need to, rep uh, um, that we need to improve, you All the weight can't just fall upon the woman of God. All the weight can't just fall upon the children, Mr. Franklin, and that's deep. You know what I'm saying? And matter of fact, most of the weight fall upon the man of God. <laughs> You see, when God is dealing with them with repentance, God going to say some things to the congregation, but it's like he gets serious when it gets down to the priest. Oh, God would always call out the priest in the Old Testament. He would always call out the priest. He would deal with the priest first. 
Because as the priests go of the house, goes the people, man. You know what I'm saying? The priest is to lead first. Let me read this thing. Look what it say in uh, verse 2. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Verse 13. So rent your heart and not your garments. That's what God tell the people. Rent your heart and not your garments. He said, return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious in mercy, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And he relents from doing harm. He said, rent your heart and not your garment. Because this is so deep, man. You see, people, y'all, is, is whoo, God, with the wisdom of Satan. Who God, with the wisdom of Satan, y'all. People know how to speak the right things. Oh, God, this is deep. People know how to act the right way. Hmm. Let me stop right there, because it's not just speaking and acting. People know how to speak humble. Oh, God. And they know how to act humble. But it's not in their heart. <laughs> All they're doing before God is rending their garments. Mm. And they never rend their heart. And that's scary. For somebody to be able to, to speak humility, speak humble. For somebody to be able to act Humble, y'all, but yet humility is really not in their heart. It's really no heart of repentance. It's really no godly sorrow. It's only godly sorrow that leads to repentance, y'all, that brings forth life. Ooh, that's so deep, man. That's so deep because that's what was going on, especially with the priests. He dealt with the people. He dealt with the congregation. He said, rent your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, man. It was all about repentance, all about repentance, y'all. He said in verse 14, why? He said, who knows if he return and relent and leave a blessing behind him? Who knows if God don't turn around and relent from doing harm, y'all? And Joel is telling that to a whole nation. He's telling that to his people. He's telling that to Judah specifically, y'all. And he's telling that to us in these New Testament times. Joel is crying out to us. He's, he's making a call of repentance, y'all. And he's telling us to rent our heart and not just our garment. But even deeper, he's dealing with the with the priest of us. Who? With the heads of us. I told you that we, he was making inquisition with the head of states, with what? The upper echelon, y'all. He's dealing with the priest. He's dealing with the head, he's dealing, y'all, with the father figures. He's dealing with the husbands. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because we got to lead in this thing. In every area, I was telling that to my wife, in every area of our lives, we got to go before, man. We got to go before. And for them that will be husbands, we got to go before. And I wanted to put a scripture in the, um, Ephesians when it talks about wives submit to your husband. But that scripture starts in verse 521 where it says submit ye one to another. <laughs> we don't want to hear that, that the men going to have to do some submitting as well. Oh, 
in, in, in areas. And we talk about, we talk about, you know what I'm saying? That that word love is only for the woman, like the woman only need, need love. But in the book of Titus, it tells the women to do what? Love their wives. Love their husbands, man. And then what it is, y'all, is all a word of submission. We submit to God, but we got to submit in areas to one another. You know what I'm saying? And that's the call. We got to lead in all these things. You know what I'm saying? And sometimes I got to go to my wife and be like, wife, I'm sorry. <laughs> I got to go to my children and be like, I'm sorry. Come on, man. We're going to keep it real up here, man. You know what I'm saying? And that's a real leader, Nick. To be able to repent. <laughs> to be able to say I'm wrong. That's a real leader, man. That's a real leader. Because I was listening to that song, and she said, ooh, how she said that? She said, she said, nothing can grow by one man's show. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She said, she said, she said, when you kneel down, he bring you higher. <laughs> Man, look, bust my head, y'all. Bust my head. And that's the way of God, man. The way up is down, y'all. And we lead in that area, Cav. We don't wait for our wives to do it. He said, deal with your wife according to knowledge. As being what? The weaker vessel. You know what I'm saying? Now we're going to leave. We're going to be the priests of our home. And I talked to you about that before. But at the same time, y'all, we got to understand that they're the weaker vessel. We got to deal with them according to knowledge. And that's a, a scripture, not just for your wife, but it's the principle applies in every situation that you're in. That's how you got to deal, man. That's how you got to deal with your brothers and sisters in Christ. That's how you got to deal with, with those that's under you and those that's over you. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I liken it to like this, y'all. I liken to this fake walk. You know what I'm saying? It's like us driving in traffic. Mm. And when we drive in traffic camp, we got to drive not only for ourselves, but for others. Ooh, woo. It don't matter the, 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 the expensive vehicle. They might have a more expensive vehicle than you, meaning that they might be higher than you. Or they might have a lesser uh, vehicle than you, meaning that they might be under you. But you still got to drive for both you and them. We fumble with this in the faith. Mm. You see, we got to walk on our faith, y'all, not for ourselves, but for others. <laughs> that we have no crashing, oh, God, in this walk of faith. I got to walk this walk not just for myself, but for others. Those that's under me and those that's above me. Why, Miss, Miss Dawn? That it be no crash. <laughs> he said, do all in your power to live peaceably with all men. You know what I'm saying? And it brings it back to that leading. You know what I'm saying? That leading, stepping out first in all these areas. And I'm talking to the man of God. Man, you know what I'm saying? Because it's time to leave. He's bringing back the cloak of Peter, man. He's calling for the priests again, Nick. <laughs> In these New Testament times, y'all. 
weeping between the porch and the altar. You know what I'm saying? Verse 15. He said, blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. He said, gather the, the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble, assemble the elders. Gather the children and the nursing babies. This repentant call is so strong. He said, call everybody, cat. Don't leave nobody out. He, he goes so strong about it. He said, not only the children, the nursing babes, you know what I'm saying? But he said, a bridegroom out from her chamber and the bride, the, the, and the bride from her dressing room. He said, this thing is more important than getting married. Come in and repent. Come in and get before him, weeping between the porch and the altar. Because once we operate in that fashion, once we answer the call, Nick, all these other areas going to be good. Man. All these other areas going to be good. You see, we can't win, y'all. We're trying to win without putting ooh, the, the, the first things first. And that's what we're going to get into when we come back. We're going to get into 1 Timothy chapter 2, y'all. And he talks about, Paul talks about first of all. Talking about prayer, y'all. First of all. And the reason why this prayer is so important. The reason why this penance is so important, y'all. You know what I'm saying? Within this chapter of Joel, Joel chapter Chapter 2, verse 11 tells us, because it was a, the day of the Lord. It was the day of the Lord. It was a day where God was pouring out wrath and judgment upon one hand, but on the other hand, he was pouring out restoration and blessing. And all we trying to do is not fall on the hand of wrath and judgment, but we want to fall on the hand of restoration and blessings, y'all. In these last days, by heeding unto this prophecy of Joel. And it's going to start with the priest. It's going to start with the man of God. It's going to start with the head of the church who's under the head who is Christ. It's going to start with the head who is over the woman. It's going to start with the father. We got to take the lead in this thing. It's going to start with the leaders, man. We got to take the lead in this thing. You see, God don't do nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That he won't do. And that's how leaders got to be. That's true leaders. We go before the people. We see it before the people. We see ahead of the people. And that's how the kings operated in these old days. The king wouldn't stay home when it was time for war. No, they would get in trouble when they do. Ask David. <laughs> you see, when it was time for war, the kings would go out first, y'all. They would go out first. They would go out first. And that's why it's so vital for the women of God, like we said last time, to allow the men to be priests, to operate like, like, like Deborah, and to call them to their position. Because there's leading up here. Whoo! This preaching the word, handling the word, yo, it was tailor made. Who to lead by the men of God? Because we leading into war, yo. You gotta understand that it's a battle. It's a spiritual warfare that's going on. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, yo, in heavenly places. It's a war that's going on, man. You know what I'm saying? And we're going to get into that when we get into this, this, this text. And um, you can write it down, man. When we come back, we're going deep into 1 Timothy chapter 2, y'all. Verse 1. 
And we're going to deal with this therefore. We're going to deal with this good fight of faith. Where Paul said, first of all, prayers, supplications. Oh, God. You know what I'm saying? And we're going to deal with all these elements of prayer. I wanted to get into it today, but I'm, God held me back. He said, nah, man, you're going to just give, just give them an understanding of the weeping between the porch and the altar. And if you know me, it was hard for me because I like to go in, Miss Terry. I like to go in. You know what I'm saying? But God know what he's doing. God know what he's doing. Ooh, he's getting us ready, y'all, to do some mighty things in Dallas, man. Some mighty things in Dallas, y'all. Ooh, man. Some mighty things in Dallas. That if he would have told us, we wouldn't believe it, y'all. We about to watch him move. <laughs> We're about to watch him move, y'all, as we respond to him. Because this call of repentance, I told you that, that, that the wrath and judgment of God is tailor-made. It's set for the destruction of the wicked, I told you. But God allows it to be aimed and target the people of God. And it's not for their destruction, but that they respond. That they respond with repentance, y'all, that God might do what? That he might restore. That he might bless. Ooh. And that's what he does to the people of God in Joel. That's what he does to Israel as a whole. That's what he does to all the people of God, y'all. That's what he does. When they respond right, and it's all being led by the priest. An office of masculinity. An office that's specifically targeted the man of God. The fathers. Who? The husbands. Them that's head of household. You know what I'm saying? Paul said, let men everywhere. Lift up holy hands. And I thank you, man, Ooh, for just sitting under this word, y'all. For God is doing a work, y'all. Hmm. It was a ministering night. Lord, you ministered unto us, Daddy. We thank you for your word, God. Just taking our time and just learning, God, the ways of the priest, God. Going into the Old Testament, looking at the sacrifice of offerings, God. Looking at the incense of offerings. Looking at the porch of the priests that was built by Solomon, God. That the priests, God, they was called to weep between the porch and the altar, God. Weep in prayer, God. Weep in standing in the gap for the people of God. And it's a call unto the man to weep in the gap for his family. Weep in the gap for his children. To lift up holy hands in prayer. Because the man of God find the time to do everything else but pray. And I know we got to provide. Ooh, day. I know we got to provide. But it's the most high that provides through us. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these other things are going to be added. When we put first things first, y'all. We get first. First things first as results from God. And it's beautiful to watch, man. Ooh, it's beautiful. So y'all, I just come before you and just ask that you bow your heads right now. 
as we just let them keys minister to us. I'm just flowing because it's just so sweet. I, I feel his presence, y'all, in the midst of us right now. Smiling. Oh, Daddy, I thank you for being in our presence. Y'all repeat after me, say, Father, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for what you've done by sending your son to die on the cross for all of our sins. We thank you, Lord, that the sacrifices in these Old Testament times was all suffice. It was all done through one sacrifice of your dear son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for his blood. We thank you, God, for him dying. We thank you for him rising on the third day with all power and with all might. Father, save us and fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Woo! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Do your thing. Do your thing. Paulie. Let us stand all over the building. We are so grateful for the word that is piercing our hearts and it's doing an inward work, as the, as the word says. It may not look like we're changing on the outside, but it's kind of like a microwave where the food gets cooked from the inside out. And I'm just so grateful that God has blessed us with someone that is passionate about communicating with him and doing it in a way that's effective because the word of God says the effectual fervent prayers of the righteous man availeth much and so we're at this point now where I don't know if y'all know what's going on around us right now as we speak two wings of the same bird are sitting there having a conversation tonight a debate about the fate of this country. But I know somebody that's more powerful than those people in that room. And what we need to be focusing on is not how we're going to cast our vote, but how we're going to communicate with a holy God. So God has sent us, and the word of God says, how, how can they hear except they send a preacher? So God has sent someone to preach and to teach. And our job is just to make sure that we're understanding these precepts as he teaches them to us so that we can apply these things to our lives, so that we can activate these things in our lives, so that we can be those people with effectual, fervent prayers that, as my grandmother would say, that go beyond the ceiling fan. Because sometimes we even know when we get in prayer with God, we know, you know, God, I could, I feel like I could, I could be more something. You know, it's like you, you feel like your, your prayers, not that they're hindered, but you feel like you could pray harder. You could pray with more conviction. You feel like you could pray with more passion. 
you pray, feel like you can pray um, with more desire. This is where we're heading, y'all. Because that's what he desires from us. Psalms 37 and 4, y'all heard me say this before and give y'all give y'all my testimony about it. It says, delight thyself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. When you delight in the things that he delights in, and what does he delight in? Don't you like getting a call from somebody that you love? Don't you like getting, you know, somebody reaching out to you and saying, man, I was just thinking about you. I love you forever. Don't you, don't you, don't you love when somebody says, ma'am, I love you. What can I do for you? You just it's on my heart. That's the same kind of communication the most high wants from us. So tonight, I know Bryce has already prayed and we're gonna get up out of here. But I just want y'all to understand something simple. God loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. And the big part of a relationship is forever. what? Communication. I love you forever. Don't think you got to go to God with most gracious and all wise God. We it ain't always got to be that. It's forever. a time for that. We'll but sometimes it's like, y'all done heard we'll Bryce say it, Daddy. Y'all done heard Pastor say it, Daddy. Father. We'll praise you. Forever. As formal and informal we'll as you need it to be. Let it be authentic. We'll Let it be real. Forever. Let it be focused. Lord, Let it be we'll worship heartfelt. Forever. We'll so I'm just going to say, may the Lord bless you. Forever. May he keep you. We'll may he cause his face forever. to shine upon you. Lord, and may he bless you with your own peace. We'll Love y'all. Y'all be blessed. We'll and also, forever. July the 4th, we'll worship we forever. are going to say live. Say live mean what? Rest. So we will not be meeting on July the 4th. So y'all just know that because I know uh, folks be showing up on Sundays and everything else. Talking about, are we having service and stuff? So I'm just letting y'all know. No, we are not having service on next on Thursday, July the 4th. So y'all be blessed. We love y'all. And we'll talk to y'all soon. Amen. Amen. We'll worship forever, Lord.